Good day, everybody. This is John Scarborough back in the woods here. Um, I say it's the woods, it's woods on that side, and we're just kind of on this little buffer zone. You can tell right through the trees. That's the that's the pasture. That right there is our hill. That faces that's a north facing hill. So back here in the woods is the is the north. That's pretty much straight north there. Um, and so that's a north facing hill there <clears throat> so that what that means is that this woods line is a south facing uh, woods line what that uh, don't, the only real issue there is when you have a north facing hill sometimes it's a less fertile hill the hill itself because it doesn't get as much sunlight um, anyway we do have a few places that are issues like that but um, what I kind of wanted to address today I've kind of spoke about it briefly in some other videos i'm back in the woods here with my um young heifers raising a couple of young heifers here separated them um from the herd just because they're they're to the point where they could get bred um but they're still smaller than i'd like to have a bull on them um i know some people do uh raise their animals where they just keep everything in there and let the um let the mamas wean them and then they let the bulls uh, and let the bulls breed the heifers when it happens uh, all naturally and uh, and I don't have anything against that I, I think that's great um, the issue is is the way we started we started with genetics of people that did not do that so we were able to start with the genetic uh, of a cow that was about 95% grass fed in other words he never fed his mamas um, and occasionally he would feed his bulls um, so for the most part, everything was grass fed. Um, and then, then of course he would sell them to, um, like a feedlot or something like that. But he, his genetics of his cattle were, um, were grass fed because he believed in, you know, he understood the, the, the benefits, um, for his pocketbook, you know? Um, but anyway, so the point is, is that the genetic, these genetics, these cattle have, um, their mother's. Uh, were held off for two years before a bull was ever put on them. So you don't want to just, if you're trying to slowly get into a, a better, um, like a, a certain way that you want to do something and you're wanting to change, kind of be different from everybody else, you don't want to do that all at one time. And I'm not saying that I'll ever do that. I may not. I may always hold my heifers off. Um, I kind of appreciate the system of not, uh, not holding the heifers off and leaving them in and letting a natural cycle happen that i appreciate the simplicity of it being able to leave everything together like that uh but we're not quite ready for that we had i showed these in a video early this spring um and it was a video about a split herd and for the most part so what i ended up doing is i got them off of my property and i actually i traded one of the heifers to somebody in order to keep these heifers on their land um for about six months and that really helped out a lot that that gave me the ability to actually raise these heifers get them away from the bull um you know and all like that and, and that just that just helped in a lot of ways but as far as the split herd thing that for me i really didn't like it at all obviously just because you're grazing more than one pasture uh, at a time and it really slows down your production um so i was glad to be able to get away from that and we run our bulls uh that we only take them off to keep the the calves to keep from having calves in the middle of summer that's the only time we take our bulls off so it's about three three to four months out of the year um, other than that we run them all year round so that's what was kind of hard for us uh was that was but this guy that we brought him to we were able to uh he did he did not run his bulls that way he only runs them for about 45 to 60 days and then so I was able to run these in with his heifers and it wasn't too big of a deal. Worked out good for everybody. But kind of what I wanted to touch on today, I was just kind of giving a brief overview of some of the things, some of the last videos that I've shown and stuff like that, kind of answering some questions in that. I uh, hope y'all don't mind. But what I wanted to touch on and probably what the video will be titled to is um, kind of these areas where you see creeks and um, sunlight, okay? They call these riparian zones. I've, I've heard some people call them riparian. I think it's pronounced riparian. I'm not actually sure um, which the way you pronounce it. I've just heard people call it 
a couple different things. So put in the comments if y'all are watching this video. Put in it uh, if you if you think that it's pronounced riparian, put number one. If you think that it's pronounced riparian, put number two. Uh, and if you think it's pronounced another way completely, then just put crazy. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I don't know um, how it's pronounced exactly. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's riparian zone. But anyway, basically what a riparian, a riparian zone is, is it's where you have a little creek or a little wash, uh, a little, a little uh, water drainage. This is basically just a drainage um, from a neighboring pond. That's all it is. It, it's literally, I could follow this up, not even a mile, maybe a quarter mile, maybe a half mile at the most. Follow it up. I know the guy, know the, where the pond is and everything. And then, of course, a little bit of wash off from the hills on both sides. There's a hill on both sides of this where it actually runs down into here and then runs down into there. So that contributes to quite a bit of the water in there as well. So a riparian zone is where you leave or plant trees around water area, a water flow area like that. In this case, these trees were left, uh, and I think it's a good thing that they left them here. Uh, for me, it's a really good thing along a fence to have trees close to the fence protecting uh, the sunlight from the fence because then you, you barely ever have to worry about your fence. You could do electric, you could do anything you want. You don't have to worry about it growing up hardly at all. You know, it's a low maintenance fence. But the downside here is this creek. We actually do want sunlight in here. What we want is the riparian zone with the trees, but then we want the sunlight to allow the growth. So what happens here, this is an issue that comes up quite often, is you can see the sunlight has been fully blocked off. The south, I mean, that you go out to the south that way. So the south hits that wall. It builds up with all of the growth hitting, the sun, hitting that over there. And then you end up with a wall that all of that is hitting light. And you got a wall there that blocks the light all back in here. So over time, when this system was first left, that wasn't there, and we had no no issues with this washing because there was still growth in there. There was grass, and you can see evidence of grass and growths kind of all in here. But then over time, because you couldn't maintain it with a tractor, you could only brush hog up close to the trees, but you couldn't maintain all of that uh, with a tractor and hit all of that brush and knock all of that back successfully um, without some expensive equipment or hiring somebody to do a lot of work or doing a lot of that work yourself and it and it just not you know it's not um it's not really efficient it's not something that you can hardly afford to do with such a small it's a small area it's a low profitable area it's, it's there's not a lot of profit here if we had planted this we could have planted this in productive trees and that would increase the profitability here and then, um, then you would actually have the money to invest a little bit more towards the cleanup, towards the clearing. So if you are thinking about a riparian zone, keep that in mind. First off, I want, to, want everybody to know I am pro riparian zone. I think they're, they're great. Um, I think that they're necessary. You should either leave one or plant one or do like what I plan to do, and that is enter plant one. So you've already got one like this, and you kind of selectively take a few away and then add the add the profitable trees or the trees that are, um, excuse me, the trees that are, um, uh, so either profitable in income or profitable in food or profitable in both. Uh, now they could be profitable in just a food source for animals. So you could do, um, even acorns would be profitable to pigs if you raised pigs down through here. Uh, you got to be careful with raising pigs with water. There's goods and bads to it, so you just kind of got to know what you're doing. And acorns are not good for cattle. They're they're poisonous to cattle, especially when they're green when they first fall. Uh, you can you can kill cattle that way. They can eat a few and be okay, but if they eat a bunch, which they usually do, because food the green grass is starting to get a little scarce, and they can taste the fat that's in that acorn, the fat and the carbohydrates and they go in there and start eating it. Um, I think back in the day, I'm gonna get off on a little bit of a, a little bit of a story, but I'm gonna come right back. I think back in the day, we used to have um, 
I know that about 200 years ago, we had a lot of hazelnuts and, uh, well, hazelnuts mostly in this part of the country. Um, we also had a lot of um, uh, chestnuts, hazelnuts and chestnuts. But <clears throat> the thing is, is we had as many of those trees 200 years ago as we do oak trees. Okay, so we had a mix in our forest of acorns, multiple different species of acorns, and then multiple different species of, uh, uh, multiple different varieties of, uh, of acorns, chestnuts, and um, hazelnuts. So what I think would have happened, and, and all of that was wiped out from a blight, from blight. It was a big blight thing, and, and, it, and it was a type of fungus, and it just wiped out nearly 90, I think it was 90 something percent of the, it may have been more than 90 percent. Um, the Oregon was the only one with any of it left. And I think it was just in a valley in Oregon that had any chestnuts left at all. Okay. So basically it no knocked out a huge percentage of those uh, chestnuts and stuff like that. And we don't see any left because it was a huge blight. And then the trees that would grow up, the seedlings that would grow up, they would get the blight and then they died. So it was, it was like a mass extinction across America. So now we don't even see that coming up at all. We just see nothing. So I think, and of course now they have blight resistant, um, they've come up with blight resistant chestnuts and things like that. But what I, I believe is that back when we had all of those chestnuts and hazelnuts and you had that huge mix that the chestnuts and hazelnuts that the consumption the cattle consumption of the chestnuts and hazelnuts first off they would eat those uh eat quite a few of those but they would eat the acorns as well and the consumption of all of them um kind of kind of blunted the toxicity of the acorn that's just my theory i don't know that for sure Long story short, I'm going to come back now, and I apologize for going off to that, but that's just kind of a side note. Um, but anyway, so the point is, is that we can't, we don't really want to plant an oak tree if we're going to have cattle in here and use it for shade. It's really nice shade in here, um, especially with this north-facing wall. It's also a good place in the winter for your cattle because they can come up here with this whole north-facing, it's a north-facing hill. No, I mean, this is a south-facing hill. But the point is, is this hill blocks the the north wind and then the trees block it even more so this is a wonderful place summer and winter for cattle so it's not really an option for me to block them out of here um or at least not yet however if i could plant chestnuts in here then a i could sell the chestnuts b i can eat the chestnuts c the pigs can eat the chestnuts and uh d the cattle can still eat them and be just fine so what the point is, the long-winded way of saying that, then that would be a productive riparian zone. So if you can interplant things like that. And then, of course, I could also plant fruits and things like that. I could plant a fall fruit like a, a persimmon or something like that. Um, some of those bigger persimmons that you get in, in uh, Japan and, and, well, across Asia um, and things like that. Those are very good fruits for uh for pigs and for cattle i mean they love them and they will put on some weight doing that and and it it's late enough in the season that it can actually help them to put on a little bit of a, a fat layer just before they get into that cold um, so that is something to consider plus persimmons are very resistant to a lot of different things they're very tough and extremely pr productive and they almost don't even like fertilizer they pretty much, if you fertilize them, sometimes they'll throw their fruit off. They'll, they'll, they'll have green fruit. You fertilize them and they'll just throw it away. They, they'll just drop every bit of it. Um, so what that is, is that's a very productive high yield shade tree that holds in, um, holds in moisture and keeps from washouts. But at the same time, it feeds animals with hardly any, any inputs to you at all. And it doesn't take just a huge amount um, away from the grass that can grow under it. So those are different options that you could do. So the point is, is that's one thing that you can do eventually. And that's something you should consider if you've got a riparian zone on your property or you're wanting to plant a riparian zone on your property. Um, and all of this is assuming that your local laws will allow you to do that. I don't know anything about other states. But anyway, so those would give you productivity 
and allow you to be able to afford either the time or the um, or the equipment or the manpower, the labor. Um, one way or another, the, it would help you to be able to afford and offset some of that. But the bottom line is, is one way or another, no matter how you slice it, the sun hits only one side and not both. What you end up with is a wall that stops the light. So what does that mean? Okay, you, you get a wall that stops the light. Well, that means that you get no more grass growth in here. So what we've seen is a progression of this creek with no, no washing out and no issues to the point now where after several years of that not getting taken care of, um, because there was no way to afford to take care of it, that now we're starting to see more washouts on down the line. I did another video kind of showing a little example of that. We're seeing more issues with that because the sunlight can't get in and let the smaller grasses and things like that grow, okay? So what has to happen is you've got to maintain that. And a big portion of what that is isn't, isn't limbs. You can cut limbs out with a chainsaw fairly, fairly easy, but it's briars, okay? It's things like this growing up the trees, coming up and down, and, and, and it's all the briars and all of the um, little berry vines and things that are just, they're extremely invasive. Uh, and without a goat or something to eat that, then they can be very hard to maintain. Um, so, you know, goats, sheep, things like that, they can be a source to help keep that clean if you have a multi-species fence. Sometimes, if you're like us, you buy a piece of property and it's already got a fence and it's pretty much good for cattle and that's about it. But at the same time, you can't hardly justify tearing your whole fence out. So until we come up with an option, which we are considering in the future, until we come up with an option that will help us to be multi-species, we still have this problem. Secondly, uh, you could do this fairly easy. You can make this sheep proof fairly easily. You still have the problem um, with a lot of these woody plants, they will eat these, but they eat a lot of grass as well. So really, the, the true answer, if you're wanting to graze it out, is, is uh, goats. Because goats will leave grass to last. So if you can do goats, then that's, that's uh, a lot better so, uh, in that scenario. Okay. So what is the other option? If you can't afford to clean it out... Because, you know, like if you get a place like this where it's good shade and it's a good riparian zone, but you have no, there's no income source, there's not enough money on that specific acre or half acre or a piece of land there uh, to afford to buy the equipment or to keep it clean as often as you should, which should be pretty well annually if you want to do it right. If you want to keep the grasses growing in here. What can you do to keep it clean? Well, that's where mob grazing comes in, okay? Now, let me say that with some caution, okay? This right here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push over here to where it's really bad, okay? You can get rid of a lot of this through mob grazing. Um, first off, it takes some really good fences, and it takes a lot of different, uh, it takes some patience and bringing them in and just right and pushing them in here. It also takes the possible sacrifice of some of the smaller plants because in order to get them to push all of that down, you're going to seriously aggravate the soil around here. Is that a bad thing? It can be if you're talking about good grasses, good palatable grasses and things like that. But it's not necessarily a bad thing, and it's usually well worth um, whatever it is that you're trying to do, okay? Because the, the many years to come that, that you don't have to mob graze nearly as hard can, will definitely be a lot better. Um, with all that being said, if you have a mechanical me means, many times a mechanical reset is the fastest, easiest, best way to do it because you drop all that carbon straight to the ground but you don't tear up your ground or lead to any washouts because because if you do mob graze it if it's not done at just the right time and if you especially if you live where we live and, and you get a lot of rain a lot of moisture in our area and things like that we live in north louisiana so it's, it's prime rain country you know 
then you can lead to certain washouts and things like that. Um, so the point is, is that sometimes a mechanical reset is the better option if you have the ability to do a mechanical reset. If you could reset all of this mechanically and then mob graze as a tool throughout uh, the rest of your time. But the real point of the, the video, whether you have a mechanical reset or not, is to kind of get some different options out there, what you can do. If you just have cattle, you just have a fence for cattle, and you just have certain things like that, that's where mechanical, uh, no, I mean, that's where uh, uh, mob grazing can really shine is in places like this. And even if you're somebody that doesn't have a lot of time um, or you haven't figured out the system, because it's not so much about the time, it is very time consuming mob grazing is if you don't have the system so the system would be already hard fences put in you know uh, something to clip to and, and power up and good water sources uh, good clean water sources i'm not talking about that I'm talking about good clean water sources to bring them in and let them drink you know things like that if you don't have that system it can be really hard to do that uh every day until until you do get that set up. But if you're somebody that has not decided or figured out how to mob graze, or you think that it's really not for you and your system, you should still consider it in these types of areas. Um, because really you could do this in a couple of days, get this cleaned up and mob grazed, especially if you use a mechanical advantage to get you started. And then you just do this over the course of a day or two mob grazing this and then you just do this every time you you come through here unless it's a pouring rain obviously you don't want to come through these areas uh, and mob graze in a pour, pouring rain when it's raining whether no matter where i'm at i always give my cattle a much larger area you don't want them trampling the ground in and, and all like that while it's pouring rain so just keep that in mind that's a little light tip on that um, they, they can cause all sorts of washouts, but they also uh, can actually compact your soil, the same as large equipment. But as long as you're managing um, correctly and all like that and kind of give it a thought, you don't have to worry about that. So that's really just a, something else out there to, to show and really a really good example of why we do need cattle and why we do need larger animals uh, and why really just going to a vegetarian diet and i'm not knocking on vegetarians in any way but just going to a an all plant-based diet in other words everybody if there's a few people that do it that's fine but if everybody on earth did that this we would start to see a lot of havoc for these areas right here and you think to yourself well what can I mean why can't we just have the animals and feed the animals and take care of the animals um but not you know and let them eat in these areas uh but we don't eat them well the problem with that, this is the real world, um, and in the real world, you have to have income to actually take care of problems like this. Money does not, is not free. Nothing is completely, is ever truly free, okay? There are systems that will take care of certain people and systems that will take care of certain animals, but we can only really afford to do that for people or animals that haven't that cannot take care of themselves. If we did that for every animal across the board, and we tried to to never eat or never uh, use any of these animals for any so, sort of a, a food source or an income source, we would never be able to take care of these. There would be no one that would, could afford to take care of them, and eventually they would become wild animals. Once they become wild animals, you're going to have so many of them running. Uh, up and down the roads, large cattle. I mean, if you've ever hit a deer, think about how bad it would be if you hit a cow, you know? That's what farming, that's what uh, raising cattle and raising these larger animals does. It keeps those things at bay. It keeps them, keeps the animal safe from being hit by a car, and it keeps the car and the human safe, okay? We are able to raise these things and, and eat these animals and not have uh, the safety, uh, our safety or the animal's safety jeopardized, okay? You wouldn't be able to afford to keep them safe. So what would happen is eventually the government would have to thin them out to where you had very few of them 
and you just wouldn't have near the cattle, near the animals that you had. So you have to ask yourself, are you really doing good for the animal if you're thinning them out and if you're not eating them and letting them contribute to the circle of life? So in, in my mind, the best way to contribute to the circle of life is for us to understand why we eat them and to understand why we eat meat and we don't just eat a um a veggie burger you know but we eat meat why some of us actually eat meat and because you need an income source you need a way to create that circle so by doing this you can eat you can have cattle that live their whole life very comfortable and happy lives much fatter than they would ever be stuck out on their own because for one in the winter they would never have anybody to feed them hay okay um they would never have somebody to uh give them places that are just right in the summer and winter you would never have somebody that has the income to afford to nurture them and to take care of them okay so by eating meat we're actually able to give the animals a far better life than they could ever have in any other sort in fact most of our animals, well, all of our animals, but most of the animals um, uh, on earth spend more, or at least most, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. Most of the animals that I'm exposed to, all of the animals that I raise, um, live better lives and easier lives than I do and live better lives than most of us do um, because they actually have someone that takes care of them. And you think, some people say, well, but they have one bad day because they get butchered, okay? Uh, and then they get killed. Well, first off, if you only have one bad day, if someone gave you the option and said you could have every other day completely perfect, you could have all the days of your life perfect, no issues, someone takes care of every little tiny thing, and you only get one bad day, not even a bad day, you only get one bad moment, Okay, one bad scenario. Most people would choose that option rather than saying, I'm starving in the winter. I can't take care of my children. I can't, I can't be happy. I'm, I'm all, I'm, I never got a good place in the summer and most of my generation are dying off from starvation. That's, that's what would end up happening to the cattle and to the many animals because we don't have with over 10 billion people or no no near, getting close to 10 billion people on earth we no longer have the ability to have that many animals without a controlled environment for those animals so it's really a wonderful system that we've been able to create and we're still tweaking it we're still tweaking and trying to understand how to make it better not only for the animals but for us as well okay but you can't wipe it out you can't say let's let's quit uh, let's just get rid of animals altogether and it'd be better for the animals and better for the environment. Well, I'm here to say that it wouldn't be. You couldn't take care of these areas. There would be no one to take care of these areas. No one, no way to take care of these areas. You couldn't afford to take care of these areas. I promise you, you would have so much of the earth that just wouldn't be able to be taken care of like that. You couldn't take care of the, the wild animals. You wouldn't be able to take, you would have to thin most of them out. Okay. So you're able to do all of this just simply by eating meat. And my real answer to that one bad day that people say in one bad moment, I really don't think they have any bad moment at all. They never feel anything. They never do anything. We're, we're in the, we, we live in the modern age, okay? We don't live in, in the stone age where you dispatch something with a rock, okay? The dispatch system, the technology that we have now is far better those those animals don't even have an instant they don't even have a moment of of bad pain so if you're getting all of this from a couple videos that somebody put together multiple clips of people treating animals bad people treat animals bad there are people that treat animals bad that does not mean that all people treat animals bad um, and I would say that many of those videos actually happened not even from the farmer, but it was from someone working for the farmer that didn't like their job, that actually hated their job, and they had no care for the animal, and they, 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 
the abused the animal. And I can guarantee you that no farmer, no one trying to make an income off of those animals are going to allow that or would have ever been happy about that. Okay. Um, you take care of your income. You take care of things like that. So you just got to, you, you got to realize that not everything you see, it's not staged. Those, those things that you see are real, but they're not, they're not even close to what's happening all over, all across the board. Plus, there's quite a few people like me who are trying to do things that are even better uh, for our animals. Do things that are even better for the health of people. You know, and there's, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to do that. And I, I'm going to walk right over here and then I'm going to wrap this video up. It's been a long video, but I really wanted to kind of show some more examples of this. Right over in here, you can see there's quite a bit actual grass. There's growth growing on the ground right there's all green and then you go right back over into the trees and you can see where it quits okay now this right here imagine if this was all like this this is much more lush much more food for not only the cattle or goats or sheep or pigs or whatever you have in here but it's also much more food for deer this is and other wildlife wild rabbits okay and we go all the way up into here so the only reason that this is like this and this turned into this in one year is because i cleared I cleared a little spot out in here, opened this up, okay? Opened it all the way back, okay? And I opened it up for my target so that I can shoot at my target right there, okay? You see that? And yes, I do have a target. I do shoot guns. I'm sorry if that offends anybody, uh, but that's what I do. And actually, I'm not a sorry. I'm not sorry if it offends anybody. Um, but what you can see here is that me opening this up has allowed this to become much more green and lush and beautiful growth growing all the way back okay so if we can maintain that system all the way across and if we did that same thing you would end up with this all the way across here you'd have not only spring growth but then you could also have summer growth i mean winter growth from the ryegrass and you'd have growth all year round and it would all hold all of that in so not only is that growth cleaning when water flows over that grass it actually cleans it but it actually holds it holds topsoil that precious topsoil that we lose uh, it holds all of that in okay this right here everybody says well the forest floor is what protects us okay and this is what many of them are talking about and this is some wonderful topsoil back here this is this is very nice okay and there's a lot of carbon here and so you're right that the forest floor does do a lot. This right here is the exact same forest floor over here. This has the exact same leaves that are dropping, has the exact same sticks, has all of the same benefits that you see in here, okay? You got all of the same stuff, okay? You got this same exact thing. The only difference is you also have more life more ability for life okay so long-winded way of saying that riparian zones are important um, finding a way to make every inch of your property profitable because guess what money and profit is important doesn't mean that it's um, what we should be the only reason we should be doing anything but I'm sorry but it is important it's very important. I've had people tell me, oh, well, I, I just hope you're not doing this just for the profit. I am trying to make income because cash flow is the only way to keep a farm rolling. That's the only way to do it, okay? And if you don't understand that, you're better off to get out now, okay? So we need people that actually do know how to make an income, all right? So profitable riparian zones is number one. But if you cannot make your riparian zone profitable, then the second thing is using larger animals, big impact, animals like cattle that can come in and mob graze this and actually knock it back. So even if you brought a goat in right now, a goat can't even reach all the way up and eat all that, okay? But a cow can eat up much higher, and they do in the winter, but then also they actually can get in there and their and their mass is big enough to push right through. Their skin is tough enough. They don't ever even feel that. That's not even a prick to them. That actually, I have seen them go through that intentionally 
just to scratch their backs. Just to scratch the flies from their backs. I have seen them do that. Okay? And the reason is, is because they're far tougher than we are. So what would be, what would actually cause us a small amount of pain or a light scratch doesn't do anything to them except like someone grabbing and, and scratching their back and giving them a nice little scratch. Okay? So the point is, is that large, that's the other point, is that large cattle is what can help control these things in a way that is much cheaper, okay? And the, the final point, of course, is that the importance of getting sunlight back to these water spots so that you don't get all of this mud and dirt in here so that you actually have grass growing, growth growing, and holding that in. You know, and of course, a little bit of dirt is just from the cattle right here just a minute ago upsetting it. But the point is, is some of that does come from the fact that there's no grass growing across there. You get much cleaner systems when you have grass that grows all through that, okay? So, keep that in mind, guys. You know, think about that. Profitability is where it all comes from, okay? I'm sorry, but that's how it is. Profitability. But not just profitability, okay? Farmers that are raising these different kinds of food together, in junction together... That's where you're going to get, that's where you're going to find things that, uh, if you're looking for a source to, um, to be more sustainable or, or you're worried about the planet, okay? You get an, a big animal out here cleaning all of this up and helping more growth and growing more carbon and sequestering more carbon, then there you go. You get, the, you get something that's good for the planet right there, okay? But you also get a wonderful, good quality source of food. And you get a protein source that is much more bioavailable to your body, which means that you don't have to eat near as much when you eat that protein. When you eat protein from vegetables, you've got to eat a lot more of it in order to actually get that. Well, where are those vegetables coming from? They're coming from combines in the field, plowing that ground up, disking it up, and releasing CO2, okay? So just keep that in mind, okay? It's not all as cut and dry or as clear as you think, and it's not all just one, one you, you watched one video that inspired you one way. You shouldn't be just truly inspired or truly changed just from watching this video. But hopefully it does cause you to think for a minute Maybe I should reevaluate what I'm thinking. Maybe I should learn a little bit more <clears throat> about the way things work all the way around. And maybe I should understand that the whole world truly does work on a circle. It's got to have a circle, okay? And for it to have a circle, it's got to have a circle of life, all right? One thing we can do is help that circle of life to all have good nice fulfilling lives in order to have fulfilling lives and good lives and comfortable lives and for those animals to have that those farmers have to make an income they've got to ha be profitable okay in order to be able to afford to clean that up and clear that up and keep that clean in order to afford to keep your water clean in order to afford to keep grass growing back here and keep it all sequestering carbon, okay? In order to do all of that, we have to have a circle. In order to have a circle, you've got to be profitable. Okay, guys? So I hope that helps somebody. Uh, and if anybody has made it to the end of the video, I appreciate you listening and watching. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe.